It's a real pleasure for our first webcast to have with us Donna Conroy. Donna is one of the co-founders of Bright Futures Jobs and is probably one of the most effective voices out there when it comes to raising awareness of the H-1B visa program and how that program has been hurting U.S. workers and interestingly enough, the companies that hire them and the consumers out there. And uh, I'll read this part because uh, I want to make sure I get it right, Donna. Uh, Donna has appeared on National Public Radio, Dan Rather Reports, and has been quoted in Business Week, HR Executive Magazine, Science Careers, CIO Magazine, and Computer World on the impact of corporate visa programs on, US, on the U.S. IT workforce. Uh, you occasionally blog for uh, the Huffington Post, and you spent some 20 years yourself in IT support roles, technical writing, project management, uh, business education, and government. And again, Donna, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. Well, thank you for ha having me. Well, great. So, Donna, uh, is it a good question to ask? Uh, how many, uh, well, let's start off with, what is the H-1B visa program? Uh, the H-1B visa program is a program for corporations only. This is very important. Um, well, maybe I should say corporations um, initiate, it's a program where corporations are able to hire foreign citizens who are outside the country to fill jobs on U.S. soil. H stands for hiring. Okay, H stands for hiring. Now, am I correct in assuming that these are jobs that can be filled by someone who is foreign born, uh, but you first have to try to fill them with an American citizen? That's what everyone assumes. And let me tell you, the tech companies and their PR agents never will tell you the secret that I'm going to tell you now, which oh, is... A secret. I love secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so our listeners are getting some juicy today. Right, right, right. Which is that there is no requirement to seek or hire U.S. workers first. Really? Un no, yes. no requirement at all. So I can just dream up a job or let loose one of my native born workers, one of my US nationals and bring, apply for an H-1B visa, that person comes in and can take their job. Correct, and that's exactly how the, uh, some corporations are using the visa program. But let me go back because okay. this is the heart of the issue is tech companies, want to cover up the secret that they can bypass qualified U.S. workers and never consider them for jobs on U.S. soil. And um, this, and when people understand that this is the secret, then they understand how to fix the problem. And, and that's the key. Now, let me back up. Why is it that Americans Because Well, think that's great, because certainly we want to talk about how to fix that problem later in the show. Exactly. Um, the key here is that, um, as I said, everybody assumes that these white-collar visa programs, H-1B and other programs to fill white-collar job openings, is the same to fill blue collar uh, job openings, uh, again with foreign citizens. The blue collar job openings, the employers must seek, must post the job opening so US workers can apply. The employer filling blue collar job openings must um, uh, interview and hire Americans who are qualified to do those jobs. 
only when they seek and hire U.S. workers can they then access foreign workers. So everybody thinks... And that's not the case with white-collar jobs. Correct. And when we look at H-1B, because I'm thinking tech workers, and uh, in, prepare, in preparing for this interview, I wrote down some of the, um, you know, what those occupational areas are, because I'm thinking when we look at H-1B, we're talking IT workers, which are network administrators, network architects, computer programmers, IT security administrators, support specialists, you know, computer support specialists, and the mm -hmm. like. Is that accurate? Um, it's only partially accurate. The program is to allow corporations to hire foreign citizens for white-collar specialty jobs. And let me just read to you some of the uh, white-collar specialty jobs, okay. some of the jobs in America that are specialty jobs. Now, now Such, before you do that, because these are jobs where someone has gone to college. And as many college students today are, unlike when you and I went to college, they're probably swimming in debt. And now that job that they think that they might be getting with a local employer might be given to a foreign national. So this is really interesting what you're about to say. So this is not just IT. Correct, exactly. So um, some of the highly skilled specialty jobs that employers can fill without, by, by blocking qualified US candidates are recruiters, human resources personnel, Event planners. Event planners. Social and case managers, writers, K through 12 teachers, basketball and golf coaches, athletic trainers, a bookkeeping and tax An athletic personnel. trainer. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh again, this is part of the secret. Um, Americans assume that these job openings aren't highly skilled specialty jobs. And that's what the, what the corporations want you to think, is that only tech jobs are highly skilled specialty jobs. But in fact, the vast majority of white collar jobs here in the US take a lot of skill and are very specialized, such as restaurant managers. Sure food service managers, farm managers, landscape designers. These are all job openings under the H-1B program that can be filled with foreign nationals. And, and uh, you know, the problem is that employers are blocking qualified U.S. candidates and recruiting abroad first Hmm. instead of second. You, go now, ahead, go ahead, let I'm sorry. Let me contrast this. The law actually allows employers to recruit abroad first for jobs on U.S. soil. The blue-collar visa job, uh, programs require employers to seek U.S. workers first and then hire foreign, recruit foreign citizens first. So we are topsy turvy. So it's not. It's accurate to say uh, those employers hiring white collar workers and not seeking an American worker first. They're not abusing the system. They're simply using the law the way it's written. Correct. Wow. And that's the heart of the problem. Now they are abusing other laws, which we can get to, but this. This law essentially creates two sets of employment rights for U.S. workers. Hmm. So blue-collar workers have the legal right to be sought and be able to compete for job openings they're qualified to do. The H-1B and other white-collar visa programs don't require employers 
to seek and hire U.S. workers first. So therefore, what we have is white-collar workers don't have the same legal rights to be sought and considered and hired that blue-collar Americans do. So this, essentially, the solution is for white-collar workers to have the same legal rights as blue-collar Americans. So this is really, in many respects, an EEOC complaint. Correct. Yes. In Right. Essentially, like I said, the, the visa programs are dividing blue-collar and white-collar around the opportunity to compete. And the Equal Employment Opportunity Act um, is actually the laws that the corporations are violating when they, ha when they seek foreign citizens first and only. We have uh, different adjectives we use for forms of discrimination. Uh, is there a form of discrimination that we can attribute to this, to the H-1B program? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, um, there are... Uh, uh, it's essentially national origin discrimination. Hmm. I shouldn't say essentially. It is national origin discrimination. Most Americans aren't aware that the Equal Employment Opportunity Act prohibited uh, corporations from blocking qualified candidates because of race, gender, age, and national origin. In other words, ethnicity. Sometimes we call that ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the 1950s, when corporations could block qualified candidates based on essentially their birth or their looks, right? Right. So what would happen is corporations might put out a one ad that says whites only. Now, that was blocking all qualified candidates who weren't white. Now, is that going on somehow in the H-1B realm? Well, as a matter of fact, it is. It seems like tech companies have literally replicated the corporate hiring that was uh, uh, widespread. Is it blatant? I you know, I, I granted I'm not that familiar with the topic, but how blatant is this? Well, it's so blatant that we have H1B only one ads um, all over the internet. Um, in fact, uh, this is on. In, in fact, um, I analyzed a hundred job ads in 2012 that were posted on H1, uh, that were posted on DICE, which is What is a, DICE? It's a uh, technical uh, uh, job portal. Okay. These job ads, in their language, excluded American candidates. And, um, and, and sometimes... The want ads would, uh, most of the want ads actually had in the subject line um, the v a visa term. So instead of saying network administrator, mm -hmm. they would say H-1B transfer, or they would say oh, interesting. OPT. So in the subject line, there was a... Re Instead of having the job title, they would actually have the job, the visa term. And if you're a U.S. national, it doesn't matter whether you're native born or a naturalized citizen, you would know not even to click on that ad because you wouldn't be considered for it in the Correct. first place. Right. That really is discrimination. Absolutely, it is. And one, one uh, thing that m most Americans don't understand is that the uh, that the Civil Rights Act of 64 actually prohibited these type of discriminatory want ads. So we have, so corporate, you know, the HR department 
knows they're doing stuff wrong. Okay. They understand the equal employment opportunity laws, but average Americans don't. But it is so bad. These want ads, excluding Americans for jobs on U.S. soil, are so bad, and it's so widespread, I should say, that even IBM was caught red-handed by the Department of Justice posting such ads. I'll be darned. It's not just... And you can't get more blue chip in IT than IBM. Right. And we caught manpower posting and such manpower ads. manpower is a temp agency, correct? Right, right. Okay. It's a Fortune 500 temp agency. They were posting such, such ads on recruiting um, Indian citizens for job openings in um, Oregon, um, Wisconsin, and Virginia. And they were recruiting a year to a year and a half out. So we're talking about it's, um, it's not just on the spot, you know, G and HR like we, person. We have, we have a shortage. I need a Java programmer with this kind of skill set now. Go out and apply for you know a visa to get someone the best qualified person these are very conscious decisions a corporation is making uh are they making them to perhaps eliminate a uh a a u.s citizen from a position and fill that with a foreign national or are they simply creating additional positions what are your thoughts on that um most of it is to fill new jobs. But it doesn't matter what their intention is. Equal Employment Opportunity Law says your behavior is the issue. How you're recruiting is the issue. What your policies are. So, for instance, Manpower's policy was to clearly was to clearly spend a year to a year and a half out recruiting to fill jobs. That's, t- that's long-range p- uh, planning. And so, you know, again, EEO is, it, it, it is all about taking a look at how the HR department is recruiting, okay. is filling, you know, uh, what their policies are. And, and Donna, these are good jobs. Uh, for instance, I was on the Bureau of Labor and Statistics site uh, before our interview today, and the median salaries, you know, for IT workers mm-hmm. are sixty-four thousand to one hundred and ten thousand a year. I mean, these are great jobs that you're saying Americans are barred from having. Now. Uh, you sent me something that really just blew my mind when I saw it. You know, what was that? <laughs> uh, you did a, you pulled data from York, the city of York, Pennsylvania, which mm. is not a major metropolis by any stretch. It's a smaller city in America, but there are 124 visa app, uh, H-1B visa applications for that city. And again, these are good jobs. And these are jobs Americans are prohibited from seeking, or not only seeking, but having. Uh, That that, that was amazing to me. And that's that's going on all over the country. Correct. Exactly. It's the employers that are prohibiting or, you know, blocking U.S. candidates from applying. If you don't know about the job, if you can't apply for the job, those are prima facie, which I have no idea what that term means, but I think it means that's plain old-fashioned employment discrimination. It absolutely is. Right. And, and so there is, um, there's a move in the Senate to address those direct prohibitions that employers are, you know, uh, okay. be, you know, that they're uh, doing. 
So for instance... So there, there is legislation out there to try to prohibit these practices? Correct. Oh, um, interesting. Well, it's good to see Congress is moving in the right direction on this. <laughs> or... <laughs> and it's bipartisan. Okay. That's, you know, that, that's, a, that's always a good point. Senator Durbin and Senator Grassley have authored okay. a bill. Uh, it's called S-2266. S-2266. So that's the Senate bill. Correct. It will require employers filling white-collar job openings to do pretty much the same thing that blue-collar employers have had to do for 26 years now. So it means that white-collar Americans will have the same legal rights to see, apply, and compete for jobs we're qualified to do. For instance, what it'll do is require employers to post these job openings on the Department of Labor's website with contact information so that U.S. workers can actually see and apply. Oh, fantastic. Because as you said before, if you never see the posting, you'll never apply. Right. Essentially, what we've had is a hidden U.S. job market hidden from U.S. candidates. That's got to be changed. Mm -hmm. And this bill will do that. Secondly, it will require that employers hire qualified and even more qualified U.S. workers first before they apply for foreign citizens. That, uh, for visas, I should say. That is a huge reversal from what we're seeing now, which is foreign citizens get to uh, be hired first for these job openings. Now, I'm cu- so this has been going on a while, and I'm curious, you know, why aren't the most affected constituencies, the tech workers themselves, why don't we see them up in arms in groups protesting on street corners? Because uh, I just don't see it. I'm, uh, I'm wondering, you know, is it, are they as a group? Can they organize? Can they, you know, can, can, can they seek redress for something like this from our electeds? Absolutely. Anyone can. But again, the issue is the secret. They don't know the secret. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't see this hidden job market. Um, they because um, it's a big job market. Uh, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, between now and the year twenty twenty four, they expect job growth to be twelve percent in the IT industry. That's, that's way above where they see the average of U.S. jobs uh, increasing. So that's significant. This is a growth industry, and a lot of it seems to be hidden from potential job applicants. Well, again, that's the issue. Now, if you take a look at um, sites that are analyzing the job openings that companies want to fill with foreign citizens... For instance, one listed over 500,000 jobs were filled last year. Now, let me break that down. I was going to say 500,000 jobs with median incomes between $64,000 and $110,000. The aggregate of that must be huge. Well, let me break that down. We have no idea. A lot of these job openings are temporary in nature. So one job job may be only for three months long. Okay. Another job may be for three years long. Hmm. So we don't have that understanding. 
By the way, we also don't have an understanding of how many visa holders are actually in the country. There's estimates between um, 700 to 800,000. But it's important to remember these are visa holders and not necessarily workers. And I, let me define mm. the, the and term. So there is a, there, there are some things, the, the semantics are, are right. important. Right. The semantics has to do with the real circumstances that we all face, which is that there's another secret that visa holders are not always working jobs. This is very important for Americans because we say foreign workers assuming they're working here in the United States. And because the staffing industry is a huge user of the H-1B program, what you have is a temp staffing agency who... Um, and who are some of the bigger temp staff agencies that uh, utilize H-1Bs? God, they all do, but Yash... Uh, uh, Oh shoot! Now you've um, you're you're I've making me like, draw a blank. But of course, manpower mm -hmm. would be. But these smaller staffing temp staffing agencies will hire an H one B, but they don't have a three year job for them. So hmm. what happens is they might be working for three months. Okay. And then they're off for six months. So they're on. We when I was at uh, one of the big four accounting firms, we had this phrase on the beach. You never wanted to be on the beach. You wanted to be billable. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. So what happens is that essentially the temp staffing industry here in the United States is creating a um, an unemployed group of foreign citizens on H-1B visas. So the H-1B visa program actually is also creating higher levels of unemployment, not just for U.S. workers who, say, are, are, are face right. dis discrimination, mm -hmm. but they're also creating H-1B visa holders who are temporarily unemployed. So you, you have... A, a, you have two forces creating a unemployed group of tech workers in this country. Now, let me give you a little caveat on this. All H-1B employers promise to pay the foreign citizen their wages whether they're working or not. That's, That's not true for U.S. workers. If we're not working, we don't get paid. But that is true for H-1B workers, H-1B visa holders. Interesting uh, ancillary benefit to being here on an H-1B visa, isn't it? Well, that's why all foreign citizens want the H-1B visa as opposed to, as opposed to other visa programs. But these temp staffing agencies will not pay them when they're on furloughs or when they're temporarily unemployed. Even though they're supposed to. Correct. And, of wow. course, the H-1B law does not give any regulatory power, um, you know, to the Department of Labor or USCIS. So even if you were to, even if, let's just say, an H-1B visa holder were to report his employer for not paying him the wages... There's no enforcement agency. Well, actually, that's the only time, that's the only case where they can ah, get okay. some. But in other words, um, uh, Americans know what's going on. They cannot report to the Department of Labor that this essentially labor trafficking situation is occurring. Mm, interesting. Now, by the way, the uh, 2266 Durban and Grassley's bill... Mm -hmm will um, uh, uh, will provide 
that ability for Americans to report these conditions. So now that we know the secret and the Grassley bill, the Durban Grassley bill seems to be the solution. Uh, how is that tracking? Are we, ha, has it made its way to the floor? Is it stuck in committee? Um, well, it's kind of stuck, you know, I mean, most bills are always in committee. Um, what we need to do is we need to, um, we need to bust open the secret and sh once you know the secret, then people can get behind right. this bill. I mean, bill. when you see just how unfair these practices are, uh, I could, you know, for those that are IT workers that have been in the field for some time, for those that are leaving college with a freshly minted degree in, you know, perhaps uh, computer programming or mm -hmm. uh, network administration, I mean, they're really being discriminated against oh, from absolutely. Holding, a, holding a job. And this, in my view, absolutely needs to end, and it needs to end today. Now, is there anything else that you can leave us with about the H-1B program that you think uh, the listeners of this podcast need to uh, hear? Well, simply, this program is not good for U.S. workers. It's not good for workers from other countries. And for workers from other countries, essentially what has happened is we've created labor traffickers here in the U.S. who, instead of, in, who are forcing foreign citizens into temporary unemployment here in the U.S. And that's the key to a labor trafficker is the forced unemployment. They don't have jobs. Now, the good part about the Durbin-Grassley S-2266, it will prohibit the entire staffing industry from using this program. So essentially, the labor traffickers will dry up and leave our country. And no country can, can remain strong or be strong when we don't have the ability to compete for job openings in our own country we're qualified to do. And we have labor traffickers forcing people into unemployment and funneling them into temporary jobs. That is a nation that is self-destructing from within. Wow, absolutely. Well, again, Donna, I want to thank you so much for coming by today. Thank uh, you. We are committed to helping you get this message out. So uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of each other, working together in the future, uh, hoping to organize. Uh, would you call them... I guess you, they are white collar workers, but really they're oh, they're, they're skilled workers. Uh, I mean, it's not just IT workers; it's all white uh, white collar workers. It's uh, several years ago. I can't think of the author, but he wrote a book called White Collar Sweatshop. And I don't think uh, a lot of white collar workers understand how they are abused in the workplace and where maybe they need to, you know, look at the uh, uh, type of EEOC rules that exist out there and fair employment practices that exist out there and make sure that they're not being shuttered out of those benefits that come with our citizenship. Right, exactly. And um, what's important to note is that um, equal employment opportunity practices are plain, plain and simple fair hiring. Everybody gets a shot at, a, at competing for a job opening. Nobody gets blocked out because of race or gender or national origin or age. Um, and, and white collar workers need to understand that they have to stand up and break this stranglehold 
of discriminatory hiring. Um, that's the only way we're going to be able to stop this employment discrimination of U.S. workers and also stop the exploitation of foreign citizens without the ability to block U.S. workers. They cannot bring foreign citizens into this country and hold them um, as, a sanctuary, as essentially uh, hold them in, in guest houses that essentially right. function as warehouses for temporary workers. That's, and that's highly exploitative. It is. And people don't aren't aware how powerful EEO laws are to prevent such practices in the first place. That's why these tech companies love to block candidates, you know, uh, you know, women, blacks, Hispanics, older workers. Is that because they see, uh, you, know, so, you know, a kind of social quiescence among the foreign nationals that they want to bring in that makes them a little, um, you know, a little less apt to look at the way they're being treated by their employer? Um, I, you know, when you block so many qualified people, you have an extremely narrow, you know, type that you're hiring. Right. It's almost and, like agriculture. When you go from, to a monoculture crop, like corn across the, the Midwest, that's all you see. Uh, right. So the ability to have a diverse workforce is actually key to, um, to, to preventing worker exploitation. So for instance, um, older workers, they have an understanding, a better understanding of fair employment practices than, than the millennials do. You know, sometimes females, sometimes minorities might have a better understanding of EEO or a better understanding of what constitutes sexual harassment. By excluding all those workers and, and being able to manipulate by right. one set of cultural cues, then you have, you know, you can essentially it's the do with your workers of diversity. Right, exactly. And, and all the me, benefits that you know a, a diverse workplace can bring. Right, right. So you, um, you know, for instance, let me give you a, give you a concrete example. One of our members was a 45-year-old, somewhat conservative, white guy. Well, he had co-workers that were half his age, male and female, and the male was so grossly harassing the females that, and, and the females, instead of going to the HR department, they were laughing and putting up with this. So it was the 45-year-old Gen Xer who had experience, knows what a healthy work environment looks like. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was, he was the one who actually ended up going to HR. So, you know, the issue is um, the, the workplace in tech because of this employment discrimination and blocking, you know, talented people who have the maturity and understanding of healthy, productive workforces, that is wow. the root cause. Um, so, you know, hey, EEO is going to inject qualified Americans who understand 
what a good, what fair hiring is, what a productive work environment is, what a uh, an environment that's free from racial, yeah, and they'll, uh, they'll, sexual, exactly. they'll be and able age to, discrimination. Right, they'll be able to blow the whistle, the whistle when they see exploitation and right. harassment, and they'll have the maturity and the knowledge and the experience to combat these things in the workforce. And wow, interesting. Now, Donna, how can people find you out there? Just go to brightfuturejobs.com. That's B-R-I-G-H-T, Future Jobs with an S. Wow. And, um, yeah, we, uh, well, and we even have our phone number there. So we do answer the phone. That's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which Fantastic. is what a lot of organizations, you know, they'll just have an email. So we're old fashioned. Um, my co-founder and I, we were children when the 64 Civil Rights Act was passed, which is where the employment, um, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Laws, uh, were, it was part of the 64 mm-hmm. Civil Rights Act. So we remember the days when corporations did block qualified candidates. And what we saw was this pattern Reemerging now, it's full blown. Sound it certainly sounds that way. And again, so uh, to our listening and watching audience, again, that is www.brightfuturejobs.com. Is that correct? Absolutely. Fantastic. Again, Donna, thanks so much for being here today. This was great, great information and. Boy, I'm, I'm really hoping the uh, Durban and Grassley uh, bill get winds its way to the floor. It's voted on and, you know, the American people get the justice. And certainly the skilled workers, the white collar workers get the justice they so uh, much deserve. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And-